Thank you all very much for coming. It's nice to see so many happy faces out there. And welcome to everybody who's looking at this presentation online. We're happy to have you with us as well. Um, so I don't have any announcements tonight. Anybody have any announcements for us? Stephen Ministers? No? Okay. So Barb and Betsy have devotions tonight. She think of the others. So, Jay? And do you? So Betsy, we'll, we'll go here. Um, Betsy and I have taught a healthy sexuality class for 25 years or more for our children here. Yeah, more children here in church at First Press. Um, and uh, the focus, the understanding of our sex ed class is that our sexuality is a gift from God and that it needs to be used lovingly and responsibly. We follow um, a curriculum from um, a PCUSA curriculum, and I just reread it from one of our um, tech children's textbooks in the introduction. This is for the high school students. Um, but here's a summary of the Reformed Presbyterian understanding of human sexuality. So a reformed Presbyterian understanding of sexuality brings with, begins with a belief in a God of love that has created us as sexual beings to relate to one another in love. We believe in educating young people so they can learn about all aspects of sexuality, including the physical aspects, the emotional aspects, the beliefs and values we hold that inform our sexuality, and the appropriate ways to make decisions of our sexuality. Knowledge helps us to live out our sexuality in love and in thanksgiving to God. So this statement um, comes from the seven biblical and theological principles that have guided Ali's understanding that they have. Um, the first, or that we have, the first is that um, God created us and gives us the gift of our sexuality. The second, God created us for life in a community. Third, our church is a community of love. Fourth, our church is a community of responsibility. Fifth, our church is a varied community. Sixth, our church is a community of forgiveness. Seven, God gives us responsibility for our own decisions. So one reason that Barb and I keep flogging or reusing this old curriculum, we've used the same one for, I think it's close to 30 years. 30 years. Um, and and we, a lot has changed in the area of sexuality, what we need to change, or what we need to teach, I'm sorry. Um, and, but we keep looking at new curriculums and we keep going back to this old one and, and adapting it because we love that it is rooted in relationships. Um, it stresses God's covenant relationship with us and his desire for us to be in a good relationship with our families, our friends, and ourselves. Um, good sexuality depends on this no matter the age and stage, and we can be happier um, to have you here, Amy, um, to join us and educate them not so young on us. It's good for our church to continue beyond yeah. it, young, yeah. um, to keep learning and growing in our understanding of this really great chance. Yes. So we're thrilled you're here. Um, so I'll just open us in prayer. Uh, God, you are our loving creator. We are each made in your glorious image. We thank you for the opportunity tonight to gather and explore the good gift of our sexuality. Encourage us to become all that you created us to be in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so. Amy? Yeah, they need to you. Thank you. I'm going to get a little bit of the doctor. Well, this should get fully picked out. I'm going to proceed. She's reading. Um, no. So, if our speaker tonight is Amy Rod. Amy is a clinical social worker at, and AASECT. I'll let her explain that. ASECT, yeah. <laughs> Certified sex therapist at the Center for Sexual Health. She is also a counselor at the Michigan Medicine Center for Vulvar Diseases in the Department of Gynecology and a clinical supervisor in the Department of Social Work. Amy specializes in women's health sexual health and intimacy concerns, 
intimate relationship distress and trauma recovery. All right, thank you. Please. I might move around as I get comfortable and yeah, adjust to the microphone because it's very strange hearing the sound of my own voice coming back to me. So, all right, yes, it's so very kind of you all to have me here tonight. I'm so very impressed by what I just heard in the devotional and how you embrace sexuality and recognize that it is a normal part of the human experience and encourage healthy ways of experiencing and expressing that. That just warms my heart on so many different levels I can't even begin to describe. So uh, like Kathy said, I am a clinical social worker and a sex certified sex therapist, which in the realm of sex therapy matters because anyone can call themselves a sex therapist, even if they don't have training. Um, but in order to be a sex certified, a sex our governing body, you have to really be dedicated to the field and have to do a significant amount of training. And so it's kind of a, it's a, a major personal win whenever someone reaches that certification marks. It, in my opinion, it was harder than getting my master's degree to get my certification. So um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my experience and why I decided to go into this field because I think it's important to know. So I originally started off going to college and had no clue what I wanted to do. And I started volunteering with, with um, sexually abused kids in my spare time. And I was absolutely blown away by my experiences working with these kiddos and seeing their resiliency and their pain and everything that they had to endure. And so that led me to social work where I decided I wanted to focus specifically in child trauma. But something that kept coming up was these little kiddos who have been through some of these absolute horrors. The people around them weren't even comfortable talking with the kids about what had happened to them, particularly in regard to their sexual experiences and the sexual abuse that they'd endured. Um, it was very frequent that I would hear kiddos talk about their body parts in ways that made no sense. There would be euphemisms for um, you know things like the vulva or the penis. And their parent couldn't even say those words to help them feel like what had happened to them was valid or was, was a big deal, right? So I recognized that this was more of a, a, a greater issue than just working with these kiddos. And I decided to you know explore human sexuality from a more scientific lens. And I'm also a huge nerd and I love science and I love sociology. So I learned as much as I possibly could about how different societies view sex view trauma, view autonomy, view feminism, view reproductive health. And that led me to uh, devote my life to um, sex therapy, particularly with an emphasis on uh, trauma and its implications for sexual health, whether it's trauma from uh, a sexual nature or any other manifestation of trauma. Because trauma does not have to be sexual in nature to have a huge impact on your sexual health which can then have significant impacts in other areas of your life. So, all right, so I'm also very laid back. So if there are any questions that come up as I'm talking, please feel free to raise your hand and let me know. So tonight, I think Mel named the talk Sex therapy, it's not about sex. I am terrible at naming my presentation, so I've literally just asked Mel to do it for me. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about what sex therapy is, but also we're just gonna talk about sex in general and how you as lay ministers, because I believe that's what you all are, is that correct? Oh, wonderful, I love this so much that y'all are all here going to learn about this subject and then we're going to take this information and pay it forward. So we're gonna talk about how you can talk to other people about their sexuality and you can be a wonderful resource to them. <laughs> so we are gonna be talking about sex, which is a very weighty subject and is normal to experience any kind of reaction as we go through this talk tonight. So whether that is disgust, aversion, fear, shame, joy, physical arousal, everything is normal. I just ask that you recognize your reactions and allow them to kind of float over you like a wave. And if you need to step out and take care of yourself and do some breathing or... <laughs> I like you. I was gonna stay away from Double One Challengers, but you caught me there. Definitely. <laughs> if you need 
to take a moment to balance and balance and take a deep breath or process your feelings, then please do. That is completely acceptable. And as I will talk about later in the presentation, boundaries are really important when we talk to people about sex. And you need to know where your boundaries are and you need to honor them. That is the most important thing when you talk to other people about sex is knowing where you are and honoring yourself and your own experiences and your ability to consent to be a participant in that conversation. We have to model very good consent whenever we talk about sex. So honor your limits and please attend to your own well-being first and foremost. Okay. All right. So yes, uh, if you notice a strong reaction come over you while we talk about this, please make sure you revisit that feeling when you have some time to adequately process it. All right. So what is sex therapy? Sex therapy is just another form of talk therapy. So we are um, at least master's level clinicians. So you either have to have your master's in social work, which is the most common thing in Michigan to be um, a mental health care provider for, uh, practicing at a master's level. It's, most of the time it's gonna be in social work. However, you can also have your master's in psychology and community counseling, various other forms of um, mental health, or you can have your PhD, but you've gotta have at least the master's. And then, like I said, you have to be ASEC certified or going through the process of certification in order to be adequately prepared, I think, to do this type of work. So um, conditions that we see in sex therapy include things like erectile dysfunction, pain with sex. Pain with sex is one that I see very frequently working with the, um, the patients at the Center for Vulvar Diseases. So it's something I'm very comfortable talking about. And about two, 75% of women are gonna experience some form of sex uh, pain with sex in their lives. That's a really big number. So again, it's something we see very frequently. Desire discrepancies between partners. That's a very common one I see as well, when one person has a higher desire for sexual activity and the other person has a lower desire for sexual activity and trying to find a balance there. Also, there are relationships where one party may have interest in certain types of sexual behaviors and the other person may not be interested in those activities. And so that can kind of create a desire discrepancy that we negotiate as well. Health conditions with sexual side effects. Our bodies are very fallible. They change as we age. They change with the various conditions that we can develop. So things like cancer treatment can cause horrific effects to one's sexual function. Things like heart disease can impact our sexual function. Medication side effects can cause really big differences to our sexual function. So a lot of times people experience secondary sexual function, which comes after the effects of an illness or medication. Sexual trauma, as I mentioned before, what led me to this work, any other form of trauma, these can lead to things like hyposexuality, where someone kind of retreats away from their sexuality and doesn't feel comfortable expressing that, or experiences um, low desire that is problematic for them. It's totally normal to have low desire. That's just one way of existing. However, if you have low desire and it's really a problem for you and it causes distress, then that can be something that we can address in sex therapy. So hypersexuality, feeling like you're out of control in your sexuality, that's something that can also happen as a result of trauma. And then gender affirming care also falls under the umbrella of sex therapy. At Michigan Medicine, we are very fortunate to have the Comprehensive Gender Services Program and the Adolescent and, or Child and Adolescent um, Gender Services Program, excuse me. Um, so those are wonderful resources that we have. So our team does not necessarily specialize in gender affirming care, but we refer to our other programs. So treatment can either be short-term or long-term. Sometimes someone comes in and they spend 20 minutes telling me what's going on for them. And I tell them, oh, you're totally normal. And that is the end of our treatment. Sometimes I will see people for years and years because they have complex comorbidities, meaning they have things other than the sexual dysfunction. Very frequently trauma underlies that, okay? Um, and something that I just need to clarify, there's no touching involved in sex therapy. So back when I had an in-person office before I moved to Michigan Medicine, I heard all sorts of comments from people about, you know, I, I'm, I'm a nerd and I had lots of like lotions out there and I heard all kinds of disgusting jokes about lotions and all sorts of things. There's no touching, only talking. 
in sex therapy. Um, there's a service called a partner surrogate, and that is something that is legal only in a few states in the United States. And these are individuals that were formerly known as sexual surrogates. The new term is partner surrogates because very frequently they will do activities with the person seeking services that go beyond sexual touching. But sometimes people confuse sex therapists and partner surrogates. So again, no touching, that's a very different thing. Any questions about that? Okay. All right, so why is it important to talk about sex? Well, sex is not just the titillating things that we see on media. It's not just erotica, it's not just porn. Sex is power and control. It is healthcare. It is a basic human right to be able to talk about this part of yourself, receive adequate education and adequate healthcare and support from the people that love you and care about you. Okay, so this is who has the right to experience pleasure? How do we decide who has the right to experience pleasure? Because in our society, we don't give that right to everyone. Who has the right to make choices about the effects of sexuality on the body, whether it is access to medications that can you know, give someone an erection or medications that can terminate a pregnancy? Who has the right to decide what is normal, what is okay? So these are social issues Right, that are built into sex. So this is interpersonal dynamics. These are your relationships with your parents who could have been affirming or shaming. This is your relationship with your spouse and this is your relationship with yourself. So it's a really big deal to talk about sex because it's, so, it's such a large part of the human experience. So what are the factors that shape sexual attitudes and behaviors? So at the very center here, we have the individual. Whoa, that is super bright, okay. <laughs> so we have the individual here and the individual is gonna be shaped by all of these other factors. So society and culture. So we live in the United States in the year, what is it, 2024. So I'm just gonna walk myself through. I'm gonna give my, use myself as an example for this um, on the next slide. So we've got our society and culture, then our community and education, and I can't read what that says, our uh, interpersonal dynamics, including family and peers, and then ourselves. So breaking this down, so our society and culture, so like I said, we live in the United States in 2024, and there are certain laws and regulations and access to healthcare and education. So growing up in the 2000s, <laughs> no, that's okay. Eh, that was only that slide, the bravery. Okay, so when I was coming of age, I grew up in a society where Roe v. Wade had been, had been passed, I don't know, it wasn't a fact. And so access to abortion, when I grew up, was legally protected. I grew up in a time where Sex in the City had just turned onto TBS, so like it was on all of the time. And so the media like heavily influenced me. I could go and watch Sex in the City with my girlfriends and hear about like dating and sex. And this was new information because I grew up in a very small community, which I'll get to in a second. But this was now available because of the media and how it had shifted. So, um, and access to education and healthcare. Here's a really disturbing fact. Um, sex education in the United States does not have to be medically accurate. Isn't that disturbing? So literally, they can tell you anything in sex ed, right? And they don't have to tell you anything, right? They can completely lie to you and make up things like, if you have sex, you're going to get pregnant and then you're going to die, right? That's just not accurate. That's not a full picture. Um, and so uh, I grew up in a time where the education um, that was available was very much here's STDs and here's pregnancy, right? And that was better than what a lot of people got, but it did still fall under, like, okay, what's tolerable within our society. So now if we go down a step below, we get our community. So these can include, um, I'm so sorry, these can include influences from our place of worship, 
our spirituality and religion. My husband grew up with a, um, his mother immigrated from Sicily um, right before she had him and she's devoutly Catholic. Okay, so he wrote in, and I remember, sex is really, really bad and you were gonna go to hell if you had sex outside of marriage. So I grew up in a community, and a very small for our community in Illinois, where uh, there was a very large apostolic and Mennonite population. A lot of my girlfriends were um, required to wear skirts and head coverings on a regular basis. I had some friends who had arranged marriages right after high school. And so even though I did not grow up with that particular household um, mandate, uh, my friends you know, had this subscribed to them but in order for me to try and kind of fit in with them. That was pushed on me as well. And when I did not subscribe to that, I was like, wait a second. <laughs> That's not what I want to do. I was was then shamed within the community as a whole, right? Which is just part of high school, but worse in some ways. So um, access to education and healthcare. Some individuals will, again, not have any access to medically accurate information about their bodies or what sex actually is. So now if we take it down another um, level, we've got interpersonal relationships. So family, peers, and partners. My sister is five and a half years older than me, and so her freshman year of college was my eighth grade year, and I am so lucky. I am so lucky because you know she's my best friend. She's amazing, and I always looked up to her. But so she grew up in this in this environment too. We were like the town's token feminists. We were reading all of like the Sylvia Plath things, and, and nobody understood us. And she went off to a small liberal school, and she calls me up one night. She, she had just started to get her human sexuality class. And I'm like 12, and she's like, oh, Amy, you need to know all of this. And so, bless her heart, she was so affirming and just gave me all of the information that she was learning because she recognized how important it was for me growing up, development, developing, starting to date, how important it was for me to have this information about my body, about other individuals' bodies, how these bodies work, and the pleasure exists and how to protect myself and be in safe, healthy relationships. I got so lucky. <laughs> Most people don't, unfortunately. And so some individuals that I grew up with that were you know, part of these very strict religious communities experienced quite the opposite, right? If you're not wearing your head covering when you go to school, you're gonna be shamed. You're gonna be called horrific things, not just by you know, your peers at school, but by your family. Okay, so the interpersonal relationships are so huge. They're so huge for the development of self and how we feel about ourselves, our confidence. Like I would not be here talking to you without my sister and my amazing parents, um, but I was very lucky. And I know there are people in this room that had quite the opposite experience. So that also shapes how we feel about ourselves and our own internal experiences. Some people have medical conditions which cause them horrific pain during any sexual experience, whether they are conditions like vulvar jumptosis, like lichen sclerosis. There's, some, there's a condition called post-orgasmic illness syndrome that occurs mostly in cisgender men, where after they experience an orgasm, they develop flu-like symptoms for about a week afterward. It's a horrific condition. Uh, it's very rare, but still. It's, pretty horrible. Or there's something called persistent genital arousal syndrome, which is, again, another horrific medical condition where someone experiences, as the name suggests, persistent genital arousal. And this condition actually has a high percentage of deaths by suicide associated with it because it is so poorly understood. People are horrifically shaming about it. There, I can't tell you the number of I think gross jokes I've heard about that. So there's this lack of support and then it's so painful and uncomfortable and there's just not lots of resources out there. So you can have all these different medical experiences. That's just one hand. But then you could also have experiences of feeling insecure in your body, growing up with negative influences and then feeling like there's something wrong with you, which again is one of the most common things I hear. The most common thing I tell people is that they're normal because so many people come up to me feeling that they are inadequate or that there's, there's something terribly flawed about them. Which, I bet be honest, that feeling doesn't just stick with sex. It tends to go across the board. So, all right. 
I didn't even talk about the positive experiences. I should mention that, right? I should totally mention that because there's also significant beauty and joy and fun that an individual can experience on their own with relationship to their sexuality. Perhaps you find you really enjoy a particular kink when you're you know, an adolescent and that's something you find connection and frivolity with. And so that can be a wonder part, wonderful part of the individual experience. You. Okay, so everyone has a very unique history with sex. As I discussed, you know, all the factors that influence our sexuality, we've all got our own unique lens. And this can come from very good things and very bad things. So when you're talking to someone about sex, it's very important to remember to reserve judgments because the person that you're talking to has their own unique story and their story is valid and is important and it deserves to be held. Now, we talk about sexual scripts for a second. So a sexual script is the things that turn someone on, the things that make them aroused. So maybe somebody finds themselves physically aroused by watching porn of a specific nature, right? Or thinking about three ways or has a kink for something. We don't pick our sexual scripts, right? We don't pick what turns us on, what kind of gets our motor going. Those are normally developed by some exposure to something in childhood or adolescence that our body then kind of roused to. So maybe someone saw their babysitter's bra strap when they were 10 years old, and now they have an interest in bras as they are an adult because their brain made an association between that particular stimuli and an internal experience of arousal. So we don't pick our sexual scripts. Everyone's is pretty normal, right? It doesn't matter what it is. It's gonna be normal that you have one though. So that's why it's another important reason to, res to reserve judgment and to not yuck somebody else's yum. So Emily Nagoski, if you remember a name for my presentation, Emily Nagoski is it. She is one of the leading researchers in female sexual function. She has three books out now. She's amazing. She is an excellent writer. She puts all of her uh, very scientifically dense material in easy to understand formats. So one of her sayings is don't yuck somebody's yum. So I love that. I think it's silly and fabulous and easier to remember. So again, honor your limitations. So if you're talking with someone and they are discussing, you know, I'm really just, I can't stop thinking about this, you know, one particular fantasy my partner says that they want to have, and you notice that you're starting to get a reaction to it in a negative way, you need to stop. And you need to honor that limit and say, hey, you know, I really appreciate that you're telling me this right now, but I don't think I'm the right person to, you know, hold space for you with this. Let me talk to, let me send you to somebody else or refer you to a provider or someone else in the church that might have more experience or ability, better ability to listen to you while you talk about this. Because again, you have to protect yourself when you do this kind of work because... If you try and force it, right? If you try and sit with that discomfort while someone's talking to you, you're gonna pay for that later, right? That those little seeds are gonna be planted in your head and you're gonna find distress coming up and sinking in. And also too, they're gonna know that you are uncomfortable. You are gonna communicate so much with your non-verbals that you are icked out by this experience or that you are want to run out the, the room. And that's gonna be shaming for them, right? And then it's gonna make it even harder for them to get the help and support that they deserve to have. So on your limits, not just for yourself, but also for the person that you're talking to. Okay, so why might someone talk to a lay minister about a sexual concern? So here are just some interesting numbers that I found. So one in two women and one in three men will experience sexual violence at some point in time in their lives. So again, these numbers are really scary, uh, but it's really important to remember that and to be humbled by those statistics and to know that it, this is going to have an impact on sexual function, more likely than not, in some way, shape, or form. And that's normal. The body remembers, even if an event, even if a traumatic event has happened 50 years ago, the brain does not care, right? If we haven't processed that trauma, it's gonna feel like it happened yesterday, okay? And the body, the body is hardwired to protect itself from pain. And sex, 
we don't actually have to have sex, right? As, as animals, we don't have to have sex. It's not a drive. A biological drive is something that's meant to keep an animal alive, like hunger or thirst. We don't have a sex drive. That, I hate that term, right? So if we don't have an interest in sex, that's totally natural and normal. And it's natural and normal if you've had sexual trauma for your body and your brain to shut down and to try and avoid that experience to keep itself safe, okay? So it's also, again, like I said, very normal to go the opposite direction, to try and feel like you have control by having as many sexual experiences as you, as you can. 75% of women experience pain with sex at some point in time in their lives. There are so many resources out there for sexual pain that there's no reason that we should suffer in silence and think that this is just a woman's lot. Oof, I hate that. And I also hate the fact that uh, women are expect to have sex hurt for the first time. That does not have to happen. Okay, but yet we, we teach this within our society. We talk, talk about cultural influences. We have this cultural script that if you're a woman, sex is gonna hurt the first time you have it. It doesn't have to, right? You don't have to have painful sex when you go through menopause. That if something is painful, there's something wrong and you need to be able to seek support from that. Okay. I'm a little passionate about that one, if you can't tell me. <laughs> so, 52% uh, of men experience erectile dysfunction. This is a natural, liberal part of the aging process. It can also be a trauma response, or there's something called psychogenic erectile dysfunction, which is erectile dysfunction that is caused by some psychological trigger. And then, two of the three most common cancers impact sexualized parts of the body, including uh, breast cancer and prostate cancer. So the treatments for these can all, often have a very challenging impact on sexual function, especially uh, prostate cancer. So there's an amazing prostate cancer survivorship program over at Michigan Medicine that one of my colleagues runs, and it's amazing. It's a wonderful resource. Um, however, the the impact of uh, prostate cancer treatment on erectile function can be quite, uh, quite negative. Um, and you need to be able to be prepared for what that treatment is going to involve and have healthy resources for out after things like prostatectomies so that you can reclaim this part of yourself. So, and then of course with breast tissue, we don't talk about this enough, but you know, women, we have very unique relationships with our bodies and particularly with our secondary sex characteristics, so our breast tissue, because in our society, that is heavily influenced, or excuse me, that's heavily um, emphasized as you know, this part of being a woman. Oh, and bless you. Um, and so if for some reason you have to have your breast tissue cut into or you have to have a mastectomy, it's going to change your relationship with your body confidence and how you feel about yourself as a woman. And that has, there's a really good chance that's gonna impact your experience as a sexual creature too. And if you don't have resources and support, that can be a very lonely and painful process to go through. But you don't have to go through it alone. So, all right, now four of the five most common world religions also have specific teachings on sex. Most of these are very shaming and very limiting if you take them at face value. And so these are going to have a significant influence on uh, sexual function. There's a condition called vaginismus, which is the involuntary contraction of vaginal muscles, which can make any type of penetration impossible. And it's more common to see things like vaginismus on individuals who grow up in strongly devout religions. So if you are taught you cannot have sex until you're married and your body is a source of shame, except for your wedding night, and then you're supposed to just turn everything on, become this magical sex goddess and know how to do everything, right? You're teaching your body, you need you are a source of shame and you need to shut down until this one magical thing happens and then all of a sudden you're supposed to transform. The body doesn't work that way. The body will internalize that message and create something like fatuousness, which again is that horrible involuntary contraction is therefore limiting uh, the ability to experience penetration. That's not the only, not the only cause of vaginismus. However, there is a correlation there. All right. So I'm gonna talk more about corn again later in the presentation because I think it's a very important subject. However, this is terrifying. I have two little boys. They're gonna be four and seven pretty soon. And so this terrifies me. Um, the average first exposure to porn is age 12. And the thing is, it's not just 12. It's the types of porn that they're seeing. So the types of porn that kids are seeing these days is not like the porn that was on HBO when I was a teenager. Like, this is some really violent 
extreme types of pornography, things that if you don't understand how sex works or what it is, which I don't know any 12 year old that does, and you see this, it's gonna create a really unique idea of what sex actually is in your brain that's gonna be, unfortunately, probably very demeaning to individuals that identify as women. It's not gonna be focused on female pleasure at all. It's gonna teach you that your body has to look a certain way, which it doesn't, right? And your body has to perform a certain way. It's gonna be about performance, which again, I hate as a sex therapist because sex is not about performance. It's about pleasure and satisfaction. So this porn is extreme, intense, dehumanizing in a lot of ways, and these kids are getting exposed to it. There's there's even a number I read that says it's at age 10, but that number I couldn't find replicated as frequently as 12. So, and then, on top of that, lots of kids think porn is helpful. Some can be, but not a lot of the porn that they're being exposed to. And the reason I think this is, is because they don't have any other form of education, right? If your only exposure to sex is porn, and this is like your instruction manual, then you're learning the wrong things. But unfortunately, I believe as a society, we're failing our kids in that way. So these are reasons why someone might have a concern and might want to talk to someone about it. Okay, so again, what are some most common reasons why someone's gonna come and talk to you about sex? So they might be information seeking, like, hey, has this ever happened to you, right? They probably just wanna be told that they're normal, they're not alone. Um, pain, illness, fear, they're afraid of something that's happening with their body, they're afraid about a dynamic with their partner, with themselves. Uh, isolation, sometimes people have no one else to talk to, um, about their concerns and they feel very lonely, which is terrible, and so they might just want some support. <laughs> Sexual trauma, other forms of trauma, concerns with porn or masturbation, concerns with infidelity, relationship distress, and the list goes on and on. Okay, so I'm gonna get a sip of water before I keep going, and about how much time do I have left? About 15 minutes or so? Okay, hold on. Okay, so how to talk about sex. You need to be mindful of where you are at. So in the middle of a crowded restaurant <laughs> might not be the best place to talk about sex, but you would be surprised. Sometimes people bring it up in an environment where it's chaotic and so they feel more comfortable because there's chaos around. So also, I'm very big on consent, right? Even though I talk about this all day, every day, I'm not gonna talk about sex where people who can't consent to talking about sex could hear me talk about sex. So, because again, everybody has the right to decide whether or not they want to participate in something related to sex. So, if you're having a loud conversation on the phone with somebody who's in you know, some form of sexual distress and you've got people on the bus around you, that's not okay. All right, so we're gonna be mindful of our surroundings so that we can honor the, the boundaries of others. And we can also hold space for the individual talking to us in a private, healthy, supportive manner. Consent. Consent is very important, as I've talked about numerous times already. Even if someone brings up a sexual concern to you, always ask them, hey, is it okay if we talk about this? This is the first step in empowering someone to feel better about their sexuality, right? You give them the choice. You offer that to them. Again, even if they brought it up, every single person that comes to talk to me knows that they are coming to talk to me about sex, right? They would be very lost if they didn't. But I still open those conversations is, is it okay if I ask you a question about your sexuality, okay? It's amazing the number of times I've had people say like, huh, nobody's ever asked me that. I'm like, they should. Okay, so um, now description. So if they say like, ah, this is, this is happening, just ask a little bit more. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? What's happening there? So you can get a better idea of what's actually going on for them. And sometimes the power lays in or lies just with them being able to talk and have someone listen, right? So just getting it out having someone listen intently, compassionately, can a lot of times help them much more than they would imagine. So onset, 
is an important question to ask. Like, okay, so it seems like you're really struggling with pain. What do you think that started, right? Because that's going to help them understand a little bit more, develop more insight. Like, oh, this has been happening my entire life, or oh, this only started once I, you know, started my breast cancer treatment. And that's going to help them figure out internally where they might need to go with this. Like, oh, wow, that really didn't start until I started radiation. Maybe I need to go talk to my oncologist about that, right? That can be a side effect. Or this has been going on my entire life. I should probably go talk to my primary care doctor about this. Okay, and then understanding. Oh, oh, this is this is one of my favorites. I love the whole experience. Can you tell? Okay. Understanding. What do you think's going on? Why do you think this is happening to you? Everyone is the expert on themselves, and they have an idea, right? Even if they don't think they have an idea, and say, I don't really know. Chances are they have a theory, and if you suggest something to them that does not align with their theory, it's going to go out the window, right? So if we want to help them the best, we need to understand where they're coming from, right? If someone comes in and says like, you know, like my, my ED started, you know, when I had this traumatic, you know, first experience with my first partner and, um, and no, I, you know, I, I really just think it's, it's, you know, related to this medication, right? That I'm taking, even though they may have told me this traumatic history and I'm like, it's probably there. If we don't start with where they're at, it's going to invalidate everything that they've just told me. And it's going to show I'm not on their side and I'm not a good resource. I'm not someone they can trust. Okay. So we say, oh, okay. So you think that, you know, this is related to some medication. Sorry, I can't remember the example I just said. Well, let's go talk to the doctor. Let's rule that out first. Okay. You know, let's make sure that we cross that one off the list so we can explore other options too. Okay. Okay. Normalizing is a really important thing. As I said, said numerous times, a lot of people really struggle with pain with sex. You know, I've heard over half of the guys experience erectile dysfunction or, you know, one in two women will go through some form of sexual trauma in her life. Normalizing. Lots of people go through that. Oh, no way are you the only one dealing with this. We are so vulnerable when we talk about sex. Because again, we're not talking about that one sexual issue. We are talking about a lifetime that has brought us there to that moment where we actually felt safe enough to open up. Okay? So normalize. Everybody just thinks that they're abnormal and they just want someone that's supportive and loving that they feel a connection to, to tell them that they're okay, that they're normal, they're not bad, they're not worthless, they're gonna be all right. So um, those are some forms of normalizing language. And I will circle back to things that are not normal, okay? Because most things are, but there are a few things that are that need to have as red flags. Yeah, please. Um, I, I react even in that, but um, just because something is common, uh -huh. I mean, you have to be careful when you say something's normal. You got to be staying, eh, don't worry about it. It's not, you know, everybody does that. Um, there's that, there's a line there, is all I, I mean, there, you see. I think that is so important that you brought that up. So what was just brought up was, um, sorry, you said it so beautifully. Mi seeing something is normal as a way of almost minimizing and invalidating it as saying like, Shh, everybody struggles with that. You're fine. Right. So that it's common. That it's common. It doesn't mean that it's way to... No, I will keep it. Yeah. Okay. Normal. Okay. Something being com or something being normal is something being common and therefore nothing to worry or stress about. Kind of thinking, you know, taking an issue and, and really saying it's not significant enough because maybe lots of people deal with it. Okay. I I love that. I think in how you address the the wording normal and how you say it. Right? Because I think there's a way of definitely saying, oh, that's normal. Like, oh, it's normal to have painful sex the first time you have it, right? Versus. Well, I tend to use the word cop yeah. a little bit. It did not. I said either. Yeah. Did it say it's very common, but it, you know, it doesn't mean that it's okay or it doesn't mean that we're not going to, you know, work on it. Yes. Just because it is common for a lot of people does not mean it's okay. I love that. That's fantastic. And again, 
I think that you're all pretty amazing. You're here at you know, almost eight o'clock on a Monday night when it is cold, you could be home, you know, watching Great British Baking Show, which is what I would be doing. <laughs> um, but you're here learning about how to talk to people about this. I have no doubt that everyone in this room is gonna be just filled with compassion and is gonna be emulating that when they're talking to people. So be you, right? I don't think anybody here is gonna be like, Psh, that's normal, you're fine, right? Uh, so, and if you have concerns with that, you're, everyone here is welcome to reach out to me, right? If you need more ways of addressing things or particularly like one-liners, let me know. But I do think that's really important to be able to recognize that, you know, just because it's normal doesn't mean it's okay. All right, yeah, what's another question? I like the way you the first one. Lots of people struggle with because then it allows them that fits uh -huh. Is that no. Thank you. Okay, so this person just said that um, they liked the language. Lots of people struggle with their sexual health, or lots of people go through this. Yes, because lots of people do. Lots of. I have heard so many things, and they are all so many different iterations of the exact same thing. So, okay, timing wise, I'm gonna just move forward. Okay, validate and provide support. Um, ask what you can do to support them. If someone brings this concern to you, sometimes they may just, again, want someone to hold the space for them while they talk about this. A lot of times just listening is going to be doing so much good. Sometimes they may need additional support and resources. So ask, what can you do? What can I do to support you with this? Do you want me to listen? Do you want me to connect you with resources? Do you want me to give you suggestions? What can I do to be there for you? Um, acknowledge the courage it takes to discuss sexual health matters because, again, we're coming through so many different layers of trauma, of shame, and again, we want to be validated and supportive and acknowledging the bravery that it takes for someone to uh, discuss their sexual health. So if concerns are more than what you feel comfortable discussing, suggest they speak with their primary care provider or a sex therapist. And again, you have the right and the duty to set boundaries for yourself. Okay. What is not normal? Unwanted pain. Okay, so if you want to experience pain and you're experiencing that, totally normal. If it is unwanted, that is not normal. You need to see your doctor about that. If you don't feel comfortable you know, seeing your doctor because maybe they avoid sexual health matters, then we need to find another one. However, all of the providers that I've met at Michigan Medicine, particularly within their family practice and OBGYN clinics, is amazing. So, referring to you on them. A little bit biased there. Okay. Non consensual sexual behaviors. So, if someone is unable to consent um, to a type of sexual behavior, that's not okay, right? If they are feeling coerced or they are doing the coercing on um, coercion. Well, that's a word. Oh, no. Then that's not normal. Thank you. Okay. So thoughts, feelings, or behaviors which impair function in daily life. So maybe they, you know, enjoy using pornography. However, they've gotten five write-ups at work because they keep watching it on their phone in the middle of their shift. And that is something that actually hurt, right? They may not, you know, have a particular problem with it themselves. However, they're seeing concerns in their life. Also distress, right? So if these thoughts, feelings, or behaviors are causing significant distress, then that is something that's not normal and that needs, that's not okay um, and that we need to talk about. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, but everything else is totally normal, right? So anything, asexuality, uh, masturbation, kink, vanilla, low desire, high desire, it's a normal. Okay, it is a nor normal part of the human experience. Okay, here is my little bit on porn. So, porn is neither inherently good or bad. It can be used in a healthy way or an unhealthy way. So, uh, healthy use of pornography includes enhancing pleasure and satisfaction with an individual or and or partnered um, dynamic. It is morally congruent, meaning you feel morally okay with watching porn. It does not go against your value system. It's a form of, you recognize it that it is a form of entertainment. Porn is science fiction, right? The porn that we, that is available out there, it is a production, it is science fiction. 
Now, when you have sex like that in real life, you recognize that this is entertainment, okay? And it's also ethically produced. The vast majority of pornography is not ethically produced. Individuals are coerced or trafficked into the industry and are not able to freely consent. They're also not being paid a living wage or being provided adequate health care. Um, which is critically necessary if you are in this field of work. So you need to make sure that it is being ethically produced. There are several websites out there that have listings of ethically produced pornography where you can go and make sure you're consuming pornography from sites like that. We will not go with the uh, no. discussion with the middle, school, middle schoolers. Yes. The problem is that someone is being taken Exactly, exactly. So if, you know, they type in boobs into Google, the first several thousand results that they're going to get are people that are being coerced or trafficked. Yeah, so again, ethically produced. So unhealthy use. What? I don't think kids can quite get their heads around this concept. You know, from a development standpoint, I think the my bias is you need to be a little bit older to be able to use porn in a healthy way, but... Why? Well, they're going to be using it in... Ex exactly. So it's better that they have the information. By the school, they all... Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, unhealthy use impairs your ability to attend to activities of daily life. So, neglecting responsibilities, uh, not doing your job, not keeping up with, you know, activities of, like doing your laundry or, you know, cooking. Unfortunately, caregiving is something that um, gets neglected from time to time. It's morally incongruent. So you, um, you know, like are ethically opposed to watching pornography. You view it as infidelity within your relationship, but you continue to do it otherwise. You see it as, you know, against your faith to consume pornography, but you do it anyway. So that's going to be morally incongruent. It negatively impacts your romantic or sexual relationships with yourself or others. You can become habituated to porn, meaning uh, you get used to it, right? And you, you want to seek out more and more sexually explicit, explicit sexually charged uh, types of uh, videos to help you get to arousal and then orgasm faster. So you kind of condition yourself to need that visual stimuli. I've worked with several couples who where um, one or both parties have to have porn on in the background while they're having sex in order to experience arousal and then orgasm. That's not a healthy relationship for the porn. If you are reliant upon it, that's not good. Okay, um, so it sets unrealistic, unrealistic standards. The amount of lifelong erectile dysfunction that is related to um, inappropriate use of things like Viagra and other erectile function medications um, amongst porn stars, uh, male porn stars, is just terrible, right? So they're using all these medications, causing lifelong problems for something that is just setting a horribly unrealistic standard. Uh, so let's just think about the body image. And now AI, is um, making bodies look so impossible. I mean, just every single blemish is gone from these bodies, and you can't even tell that this is AI or that this is um, Photoshopped these days. It is terrifying. Bodies are not meant to be like flawless, right? We all have nooks and crannies and creases and wrinkles and moles and little, little parts less that make us completely unique and that's not important as much these days. Okay, and then unethical production. I'm not going to talk about that one again because I'm already dead. Okay, so know your resources. So primary care work providers are generalists and they are a great place to start if you have a question related to sexual health urology, gynecology, and then sex therapists. So this QR code, um, I just gave a presentation for college students and they taught me how to use a QR code. I feel so fancy. Um, if you use a smartphone and you take a picture of that, it'll link you to a website which has a lot of common resources that I recommend to people, including books, videos, apps, I can also send this link um, out to Mel and she can disperse it. I can also send you the ASECT website. So again, ASECT is the governing body for sex therapists and there's a referral directory on that website um, that has all the providers listed by state. So I will send Mel 
uh, a bunch of resources and she can disseminate them to you as well. I also have a few packets that I give out in the vulvar disease clinic, like how I talk to individuals about common concerns, like desire, how to get back to being sexual, um, feeling comfortable in your body. I'll send those as well. Okay, I think this is it. Oh, yep, that's it. Okay, questions. It's a lot, right? It makes you think, it makes you think about your own experiences. It's a little bit overwhelming, but. I just have an observation. What's your observation? As a 76 year old, um, I, I just remember not being able to talk to my parents about sex uh -huh. or much about anyone else uh, my, until I developed some best friends. And then of course we found out we were in the safe boat. But I used to go to the library, the public library, and try to get information that would help me answer my questions. And it was just woefully, yeah. Uh -huh. it was, I mean, you know, I'm talking about 60 years ago, uh -huh. you know, 60 plus years ago. Uh -huh. And it, it, it's quite difficult <laughs> that, that we do have these resources. <clears throat> we just need to find a way to make them available to the kids, particularly at the right turn. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's a wonderful part, Mary, about um, the program that we teach is that the parents, the children are in one class and parents are in another class and <coughs> parents are having a discussion, but um, also learning what the kids are learning about. And so we hear from parents that the, on the way home that there's conversation then about what happened, that they're both on the same page and it's kind of an entree that they can yeah, easily talk about. Great. That's really great. That's amazing. I might have to bring my sons here because I don't think they want to hear about it from me. I know. <laughs> it's very interesting. We thought it was an old-fashioned thing that parents did want to talk to their kids about sex. Yeah. But it, it's not. I mean, parents still today really want to send their kids to the class. Someone else. And yeah. let someone else yeah. do it. Adding uh, it's very fun. The last day we have a parents come down for the tic tac toe sessions. We have tic tac toe every at the end of every class that covers, you know, everything we've talked about in that class. And so it's usually half in the class against the other half. Feet. But the last session we have the parents come down and do tic tac toe and get us the, the youth. And it's very fun that we have to like. I don't know, masturbation for 500, you know, white dreams, or, you know, just the, normalizing completely all of the, these issues to talk about. That is okay. These are normal, healthy functions that get from God. Get from God. So it's, it's pretty fun. I do think we need to, in our church, challenge ourselves to continue it into middle and high school. We have done it, but we are currently in. That's something that we hope to continue because it doesn't, you know, our sexuality keeps changing and issues keep changing. So, mm -hmm. it's all good. So, they do you, but they do you. Go put yes. You must hear. I don't have a question, but as soon as Bill got the microphone out, then nobody wants to uh, have any work on something. I'm quite well. This is evidence. I'm the one. Anyway, Amy, thank you very much. I know that we appreciate all you have to offer us today. Thank you. Thank you.